the committee will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. And today's hearing, more than any other hearing of this year, is in fact about delivering on that promise, something that both parties and the American people know needs to happen. We need to create more transparency, more accountability in government. This week, there is a bipartisan consensus forming over a new way forward in spending transparency. In recent months, I have had numerous conversations with Republicans and Democrats, with Senate and White House officials about how we can fix this broken program. Data transparency and uh, the uh, bill that I introduced yesterday, the Data Act to establish an independent body to track Federal spending, including grants, contracts, loans, and, uh, and agencies, internal expenses, on a single platform with a consistent reporting standard. Vice President Biden also announced the administration's intent to support bipartisan reform efforts to achieve digital accountability. Let me make something clear. There is no difference in what the Vice President wants to accomplish and what I want to accomplish, and I believe we will hear today what Chairman Devaney wants to accomplish. There are differences in how we get from where we are with a labyrinth of failed or partially successful programs to one single accountability that is less burdensome and more effective for all the participants and for the American people. In a Gallup poll released last month, the vast majority of Americans blame the problems in government on too much spending for unneeded or wasteful Federal programs. Seventy-three percent of American adults are convinced that spending is the problem in Washington, and I am part of that 73 percent. In fact, if American taxpayers knew the whole truth about Federal spending, that number would be much higher than 73 percent. Let us rest assured that when we get full accountability, when we reduce waste in government, we still will have a spending problem. However, currently, the data that is established on Federal work sites, work, work, yeah, websites is unreliable, inaccurate, and most importantly, incompatible and often opaque to those who need it most. Recent analysis by industry experts reveal that USAspending.gov has only 35 percent accurate, was only 35 percent accurate in fiscal year 2009. And that is only one Federal spending database among many others. To manage multiple databases and hope each of them get better is to assume that the tried and true failures of the past will be the tried and true successes of the future. And while I oppose the President's trillion-dollar stimulus, both in my vote and in my rhetoric, I continue to believe that Chairman Devaney and the efforts he has put into affordable trial technology is, in fact, the way forward and revolutionary accountability and transparency can be achieved on building on top of a model that this committee asked for as part of, of our role in that stimulus and, in fact, the RAT Board has implemented. Let us not make any mistakes. There have been errors. There have been failures that had to be corrected. And yes, of course, often the figures were figures no one wanted to hear. The cost of, of retaining a job might be artificially higher than we thought it was going to be. But the facts are the facts, and many of those high costs were real. Well, many needed adjustment, and Chairman Devaney got right on that, 
and we have a record of mistakes that were made being corrected. But ultimately, a single reporting system over time can become more reliable than, than states and localities having to report to multiple agencies in different ways. Today we will hear from Chairman Devady and other advocates of transparency through te technology. And although our first and most important witness today will be Chairman Devaney, I want to note that on the second panel, we will have individuals who will talk about the burden that reporting gives them. And they will talk about it because ultimately our goal of a single transparent system is to reduce the burden. One system throughout government means you only have to learn it once. Multiple systems today mean that anyone who is accountable for more than one report, and most entities are, have to learn multiple systems. We want to end that today on a bipartisan, bicameral, and in this case, by branches of government. And with that, I yield to the ranking member. I want to thank the chairman for calling this hearing, and I want to thank and welcome our distinguished witnesses today. And I want to begin by congratulating you, Mr. Devaney, um, 41 years of service to our nation and very distinguished years. And you said something when you first appeared before us when you got this new assignment, and I will never forget it as long as I live. You said, you know, I want to make sure the mechanisms are put in place so that people so that we prevent them from doing the wrong things. And I thought that that was just such, I said to myself, that makes sense. And thank you for doing that. Democrats in Congress created the board as part of the Recovery Act in 2009 to put in place some of the strongest transparency and accountability measures ever enacted. As a result, the ability to track federal spending has improved by leaps and bounds. In addition to promoting job creation, economic activity, and long-term growth, the Recovery Act fostered unprecedented accountability and transparency in government spending. Under the Administration's implementation and Chairman Devaney's oversight, the Recovery Act has had historically low levels of waste, fraud, and abuse. Today, more than 80 percent of recovery funds have been awarded, and less than half of 1 percent currently have open investigations. I look forward to hearing from, uh, more from him on the Board's successes, lessons learned, and best practices that could be applied elsewhere in government. I would also like to commend President Obama for his unprecedented efforts to increase transparency and accountability in government spending. Yesterday, the President signed an executive order that takes the model work of the Board and extends it across the Federal Government. The President's executive order establishes a new Government Accountability and Transparency Board to provide strategic direction for enhancing Federal spending transparency and eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse in Federal programs. The President directed the Board to report on guidelines to integrate systems that collect government spending data, improve reliability, and capitalize on the proven success of fraud detection technologies. The Executive Order also directed the Vice President to convene Cabinet-level meetings on agency efforts to make government work better faster and more efficiently under the White House Accountable Government Initiative. We have also seen remarkable improvements in other uh, Federal transparency efforts over the past several years. Websites like USAspending.gov, Recovery.gov, and the IT Dashboard have put more information online than ever before about how Federal dollars are being spent. I applaud the President uh, for continuing to advance the goals of transparency and accountability in government. Unfortunately, budget cuts may force the White House to scale back plans for several open government initiatives. The recently passed FY 2011 continuing funding resolution slashed the electronic government fund from a pro proposed $35 million down to $8 million, putting some of those very websites I just mentioned at risk. I know that a number of transparency advocates and good government groups have criticized these cuts, including some of our witnesses here today. I look forward to hearing more from them on the potential of these cuts on open government and initiatives and efforts to root out waste, fraud, and abuse. Mr. Chairman, I have said it many times already this year, and I will say it again. Transparency and open government 
should not be a partisan issue, and I know you agree with that. But protecting taxpayers' hard-earned money from waste, fraud, and abuse is one of the most important issues that we deal with on this committee. I want to acknowledge the legislation you have introduced, and I applaud you for it, which would do many of the same things directed by the President's executive order. I understand the Democratic staff of the committee had worked cooperatively with your staff in the last Congress uh, on legislative efforts to improve Federal financial data standards, and I supported those efforts. In addition to your bill, every member on this side of the aisle joined together in March to introduce H.R. 1144, the Transparency and Openness in Government Act, a comprehensive compilation of five component pieces of legislation that passed the House last Congress with broad bipartisan support, including your own. Since we introduced this legislation, 17 organizations supporting transparency and openness in government, including some testifying here today, have endorsed the bill and called for swift bipartisan action by our committee. And finally, Mr. Devaney, it is quite a compliment to you to know that the work you have done uh, will serve as a model, perhaps not only for tomorrow, but for generations yet unborn. I look forward to reviewing your proposal and to working together on these uh, issues, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> Members will have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We now recognize our first panel. Uh, it says of witnesses, I will say of witness. The Honorable Earl Devaney is Chairman of the Recovery and Accountab Accountability and Transparency Board. And to get your title fully, are you still, in fact, an IG on loan to that position? An IG on loan, and one of our favorite IGs from his previous work at Interior. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in. Mr. Devaney, will you please rise to take the oath? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record indicate Mr. Devaney answered in the affirmative. Chairman, I won't even give you the introduction. You know the drill as well as anyone. You have been here many times. If you go over, no one is going to call the whistle on you, uh, because, in fact, we are here to hear what you have to say. With that, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, uh, for those kind remarks, and members of the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to share with you some of the Recovery Board's lessons learned. I will be glad to answer any questions you have after I finish my opening remarks. Mr. Chairman, I have given considerable thought to lessons learned from what I sincerely hope will be my last government assignment. What I would like to do today is to share with the committee ten very specific lessons learned that I feel could be incorporated into the way our government does business going forward. The first lesson learned is that nothing motivates bureaucrats to act faster than a law with concrete deadlines. The longstanding culture of Federal agencies has been to take the path of least resistance and to take the longest time allowed to enact any change. I have found that agencies continually underestimate their capacities to get things done, pursuing pilot after pilot with few long-lasting developments. In fact, there are so many ongoing pilots that I sometimes think of our government as a giant airline. The Recovery Act addresses this problem head-on, requiring recipients to report the use of recovery funds within 180 days of enactment. This suggests to me that any new law imposing requirements on agencies should include firm and certain deadlines for implementation. Second, that spending data can be collected directly from recipients with a high degree of accuracy. In the past, data entry about Federal spending was done solely by agency employees. The Recovery Act and its mandated recipient reporting changed that dynamic, proving that recipients of Federal funding could report just as accurately. Any future legislation should recognize this potential cost savings and call for the migration of all spending reporting from agencies to recipients. The third lesson learned is that this spending data can be quickly quality controlled, displayed and uniquely arrayed to achieve unprecedented levels of transparency. In the past, agencies in receipt of recipient reported data would have spent ex excessive amounts of time scrubbing that data in the basements of buildings all over this town prior to releasing it. By the time of its release, the information would be outdated and meaningless. The Recovery Act required real-time reporting with results made public within 30 days, 
four times a year. And in the end, the data was not merely published as a jumble of numbers in a hardbound catalog that sits on a shelf somewhere, but was arrayed geospatially on recovery.gov, making data available and understandable for all users. The fourth lesson is that the Federal Government desperately needs a uniform government-wide alphanumeric numbering system for all awards. Currently, each agency uses its own unique numbering system for contracts and grants. As we found during the recovery transparency process, these disparate award numbers make tracking Federal spending unnecessarily arduous and complicated. Every quarter there are mismatches when we try to align recipient reported award numbers on federalreporting.gov to what the agencies had reported to OMB in our efforts to see who did and who did not report as required. The award ID numbering process must be simplified and standardized, perhaps akin to the credit card numbering system that we are all accustomed to. Fifth lesson is that new technology, particularly cloud computing, can play a critical role in the delivery and effectiveness of transparency and accountability. In April of 2010, the Board made the move to a cloud computing infrastructure for recovery.gov, a groundbreaking event that allowed for more efficient computer operations and reduced cost. Cloud computing is a pay-as-you-go approach to information technology, permitting lower initial investments to start operations. It is also flexible enough to allow IT staff to add or subtract computing capacity as needs dictate. In an era of routing out redundancies and inefficiencies, this condensing of systems could create an enormous savings for the American taxpayer. The sixth lesson learned is that transparency can cause embarrassment, which in turn causes self-correcting behavior. In February 2010, we began publishing on recovery.gov a list of noncompliers, a list of shame, if you will. That states the names of recipients who have failed to report as required. Users can see who the repeat offenders are. I am happy to report that in the first quarter of 2011, the number of two-time non-reporters is down to 17, and the number of three-time non-reporters is down to seven. This is out of over 200,000 awards reported for the quarter. But perhaps the most important lesson learned is that transparency is a force multiplier that drives accountability. It has become abundantly clear to me that transparency is a friend of the enforcer and the enemy of the fraudster. With, less, with more than 80 percent of the recovery monies having been awarded, less than half a percent of all reported recovery contracts, grants and loans currently have open investigations. After nearly two and a half year, years, there have been only 144 convictions involving a little over $1.9 million. I am often asked why, the, why there has been so little fraud. I have little empirical evidence to prove it, but I believe that it is largely due to the transparency embedded in the Recovery Act. Number eight is that the goal, if the goal of, is prevention instead of merely detection, agencies and IGs both have a high degree of incentive to collaborate together. The Board's strategy was to focus our efforts heavily on preventing fraud from occurring in the first place, not just detecting it after the fact. That is why the IG community has provided training for more than 130,000 people since February of 2009. My observation has been that when, fraud, when the goal is fraud detection, IGs come to the table with a great deal of enthusiasm while agencies seem less motivated. In overseeing these recovery funds, the Board has learned that when the common goal is fraud prevention, agencies and IGs are equally enthusiastic, and a remarkable collaborative effort takes place between the two. The ninth lesson learned is that the most valuable accountability module is one that provides equal access to both agencies and enforcers. The new analytical tools and methodologies developed in our Recovery Operations Center have proven to be as valuable to the agencies as they have been to the IGs. I believe that a single repository for this accountability data, rather than many recovery-like centers sprinkled around the Federal Government, would be a better idea and present a significant cost savings to the American taxpayer. Finally, there is the lesson that articulating success for prevention is a lot harder to do than for detection. Forty-one years ago, I began my Federal career as a Secret Service agent, learning how to protect our Nation's leaders. How do you measure success in that role? 
Certainly, failure is easy to, enough to see, but how does one measure the real effect on a potential assassin that the Secret Service presence has? Now, towards the end of my government career, I admit I am still pondering the difficulties of measuring successes of preventing fraud or waste. How can we know how much fraud has been prevented by what the Board and the IG community did during the recovery program? High fraud losses accompanied by front page stories and nightly news segments would have clearly signaled failure. But we may be left to wonder, as many of my former colleagues in the Secret Service do every day, about what success really looks like. All I can say is for sure is that to date, in a government spending program of more than $800 billion, we have witnessed extremely low levels of fraud. Mr. Chairman, I have recently written a white paper reflecting the Board's successes and some of the lessons learned I have talked about here today. More importantly, this paper also lays out a template for how these lessons could possibly be embedded in the government's business practices going forward. I plan to put that paper up on recovery.gov today, and this concludes my oral remarks, and I will now be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in a perfect world, the first person to ask questions would probably be Mr. Towns, who, if not for his chairmanship, the, uh, the embedded uh, role that you have played wouldn't have been in the law. So I want to take an opportunity to thank him, because it was, a, in fact, his leadership that caused the kind of accountability you have an opportunity to show us. With that, I am going to waive going first and recognize the gentleman from uh, Tennessee, Mr. Desjolais, if you are prepared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Chairman Devaney, for sharing those thoughts and, and wisdoms with us. Uh, I'd like to start and ask you what some of the key differences between tracking spending using recipient reporting, as you and the RIT Board have done for stimulus money, and tracking spending using agencies reporting the way USAspending.gov does. Well, Congressman, I think we have we have discerned that recipient reporting is as accurate or more accurate than agency reporting. I think when recipients report directly, they have a parochial interest in getting it right. Uh, we built into our systems uh, opportunities for checks and balances for agencies and recipients to think about what they had reported and change it if they had to. All those changes are totally auditable, so we know what was changed and when it was changed. And we have a continuous open environment for people to change things, sometimes quarters after they have made a mistake. And, and our perspective is that citizens do come back, recipients do come back and change things because they simply don't want to be embarrassed. Everybody gets to see what they have put in. And um, it has been, um, I never, I don't think I would have imagined that when we first started, but uh, it has been a great lesson. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you believe that a permanent universal re recipient reporting requirement is necessary to achieve transparency in Federal spending? Well, I think, uh, given what I just said, I think the migration from recipient reporting to agency reporting uh, with no loss in accuracy and potential savings uh, costs would be, a, would be a smart thing to do. It, it would make it more accurate? More accurate and save money. Uh, do you think that this would, in turn, lead to the greater accountability, then, on the part of Federal agencies? I do. The, the more accurate the data, the better the sure. opportunity for those of us that spend our time on accountability to get it right. You were talking about some of the successes uh, earlier. Can you please address the number of recipients who fail to report and explain how the Board has managed to keep it so small? Well, when we first, uh, the first reporting period, there were a lot of people that failed to report, and I, and I take that to be a manifestation of a new system, a new idea, and, and people just not understanding. Uh, several quarters later, those numbers were down dramatically. And now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the amount of recipients that actually haven't reported two or more times is rather low, and three or more times is down to seven, and that is out of hundreds of thousands of awards. So, um, you know, it is 99.9 percent, which is, I think, good. Do you believe that if Congress institu instituted a board uh, that tracks spending on a larger level and not just stimulus spending, that the rate of failure to report would remain that favorable? Uh, I think it would. And I, and I took note of the um, Chairman's legislation yesterday that it has enforcement teeth in it. Unfortunately, the Recovery Act, when it was created in a very short time period, forgot to put the 
enforcement uh, pieces in it, and I think the Chairman's legislation fixes that. Mm -hmm. The Recovery Board has recommended a government-wide system of award identifiers. Uh, your testimony mentions uniform award IDs for all Federal agencies. Can you explain how this would simplify the tracking of Federal spending? Well, it, it, it became very obvious to us early on that every single agency has their own unique numbering system, probably some dating back to George Washington. So it was uh, almost impossible for us to collect data from all those um, various uh, agencies. So we had to design our own, our own data collection site. And then we have to, every time the reporting takes place, we have to deal with what we call mismatches. The numbers from what the recipients report to us differ from the numbers that the agencies tell us um, that they gave the money out. So it, it's a constant battle of trying to reduce those mismatches. It's very uh, labor intensive, and it doesn't have to be that way. If we had a common single alphanumeric numbering system, like a credit card, um, the transparency would be enhanced tremendously. Okay. Um, Thank you, Chairman Devaney. And, uh, Chairman Issa, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman, the gentleman yields back. We now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by saying to you, Mr. Devaney, thank you for the outstanding job that you are doing. And, of course, um, I remember you saying that transparency is harder to practice than it is to talk about. And, of course, uh, I recognize uh, that. Um, you, you talked about the fact that um, uh, embarrassing, you know, um, uh, sometimes you know, brings about change in behavior. Uh, what were the complaints that you were getting from the ones that who did not cooperate? Or are they saying they do, they do not have the resources to do what you are asking? You know, what are they complaining about, those few that did not uh, comply? Well, the excuses were all over the board, sir. They, they, they ranged from the ridiculous to, to those that, uh, quite frankly, probably uh, involved some hardships. Uh, for instance, we had early on some uh, tribes and some other uh, recipients who simply didn't have Internet and uh, couldn't, couldn't uh, comply that way, so we had to devise a system so they could get their reports in as well. Um, I think the um, list of shame that we publish every quarter has um, has worked well in getting those numbers down. We're down to seven. Some of those folks have filed lawsuits against the government for the um, the audacity of the government asking them to report about what they did with the money that the government gave them. So um, you know, it's uh, it ranges from the you know uh, absurd to um, some legitimate excuses. Right. Let me ask you this. The enforcement legislation that is being put forth, do you think that is going to further help? I do. I do. I think the enforcement uh, piece that is in the bill will be very helpful. I think that um, there are some, as I read the bill last night, there are some civil remedies. It doesn't preclude any criminal remedies. Um, but um, that is something that usually motivates people to comply with the law. And uh, lacking that enforcement uh, mechanism in the Recovery Act, I think some people took advantage of that. Right. Let me just say to um, the Chairman and to the um, uh, ranking member that, uh, you know, I really appreciate, you know, your leadership in keeping this alive and to you, Mr. Devaney, for your outstanding uh, work. I noticed you made a comment. I don't think maybe some people didn't quite hear it, you know, where you said this might be your last government assignment. You know, I heard that, you know, and I want you to know that I hope that your next assignment will be teaching those to do what you have done so well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, on that note, and I will be glad to yield to the ranking member. You are going to second that. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> on that note, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I, I, the, uh, just, just two questions, um, uh, Mr. Devaney. The uh, Democrats in Congress passed the American Recovery and Investment Act of 2009 to promote job creation, encourage long-term growth, foster unprecedented accountability and transparency in government. The Recovery Act establishes and granted broad authorities to the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board. Among them is the authority to issue testimonial subpoenas. Uh, Section 1524 says the Board may issue subpoenas to compel the testimony of persons who are not Federal officers or employees and may enforce such subpoenas in the same manner 
as provided for Inspector General subpoenas under Section 6 of the Inspector General Act of 1978. You are familiar with that, are you not? I am. And, Mr. Devaney, have you ever exercised that authority? No, I haven't. Uh, given the fact that you have never issued a subpoena for testimony and that you have clearly been very successful in identifying and eliminating and preventing fraud, waste, and abuse, did you ever feel as though you needed that authority to appropriately achieve your mission? Uh, I never personally have felt that way. I have been very fortunate to have uh, in my Federal career uh, rather sizable um, numbers of investigators, and we worked very closely with the Department of Justice and always used the grand jury subpoena power. So I have never felt that way. I think there are some IGs who do feel that way, that it is needed. And I respect their views. I have um, stated before publicly that I have never used it and don't feel like I would. The, uh, would you support legislative efforts to establish a permanent board modeled on the RAND board to lead government-wide efforts to improve Federal spending transparency and accountability that does not include testimonial subpoena authority? Um, I would probably support it either way. Um, I think it, um, it, it really doesn't matter to me. I have never used it. It is in the Recovery Act. Um, so I am very anxious to see legislation uh, creating a board that would do this very thing, and uh, uh, it would be up to the members of the board to use it or not use it. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Utah for five minutes. And would the gentleman yield for just a sec? Yes. Mr. Devaney, do you know whether or not the having that has ever been threatened or used? In other words, have any of your people working for you ever said, you know, we could compel uh, testimony if you are not willing to give it voluntarily? Do you know whether that has ever occurred on your watch now or in the past when you had it? Um, I don't think so. I, I think that there is other ways to get to that goal. Okay. Thank you. Yield back. Uh, thank you uh, for your service. Appreciate coming to the committee a number of times and being so available. Uh, let's go back for a moment to the award numbering system. Uh, maybe it is uh, just my simple way, but things like that just drive me crazy. Uh, that it seems like something that could happen within an hour or two, okay, maybe a week. What is holding back? Whose responsibility is this to do that? Well, of course, each agency, as I mentioned earlier, has uh, developed these systems over numbers of years, 30, 40 years. So they have their own unique numbering systems. It means a lot to them. Uh, they are very reluctant to give it up. Uh, they would argue, the agencies would argue that it might cost a lot of money to retrofit their systems to adapt to a new numbering system. I think going forward we would like to do a feasibility study to see exactly what that problem is, whether it is as big as they think it is, and uh, try and convince the agencies and OMB that this is, a, this is an issue that is uh, way past its time. So the core responsibility for executing that, putting that in place, would be the OMB? OMB in conjunction with the agencies. And do you have any idea how massive a problem is this? Uh, I don't underestimate the, the fact that some agencies are going to be outliers and are going to have to retrofit their systems to adapt to a new numbering system. I just don't think it is as big a problem as people try to make it out to be. Um, the Sunlight Foundation has been uh, very good at uh, uh, clarifying and bringing some things out. This, this statistic they threw out, though, is quite stunning. This sunlight, uh, 325 programs had re no reported information for all of fiscal year 2008, also stating that um, USAspending.gov reported accurate information for only 35 percent of Federal programs. Do you find that to be true, and how do we solve that? Well, I can only speak for our site, and I think our site is extraordinarily accurate. I know that USA Spending has had problems from the very beginning. I think the day they launched, they were, they were talking about 50 percent error rates. So, it, so um, they, they make a good effort, and I think they have improved. But um, I think as long as they um, depend on the agencies to um, send them information that has been scrubbed and changed and and um, um, not coming directly from recipients uh, causes uh, some of that inaccuracy. 
So what, 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 how do we solve that? What, should there be more penalties for noncompliance? How do we solve that? Well, I think, I think the enforcement uh, penalties are, are very helpful. I think the single alphanumeric numbering system would be helpful. I think uh, migration from recipient reporting to agency reporting would be extraordinarily helpful. And um, I think that uh, the reporting under the recovery program can be replicated in other spending. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We we now recognize the gentleman from Virginia for five minutes, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Devaney. Uh, Mr. Devaney, uh, uh, the Chairman has introduced some legislation um, sort of creating uh, a new layer of oversight. Uh, what is your understanding of, of what that would do and how it would relate to the current structure you head up? Well, my, my impression of the legislation is it is, it is meant to um, replace, uh, as, you, as you probably know, the recovery board sunsets in uh, 2013. So I'm assuming that it would, if the legislation were to pass earlier than that, it would replace the board that I chair. Um, but if, um, it, it, it certainly continues the work of the recovery board and, and makes a, a board a, a permanent uh, or as 2018 and permanent board um, that will carry on the uh, the work that we've done. And and how well do you think the work you've done has gone? I think it has gone uh, very well. Um, there have been, as noted earlier, some mistakes along the way, but I think we've been able to correct those uh, right away. And I think we've brought um, transparency and accountability to this money. It's a huge amount of money. Uh, there are low levels of fraud. I happen to think the transparency is the principal cause of that. And uh, I think when you put transparency and accountability together, you get a great combination. And uh, we have also uh, used new tools. We have created a, what we call a recovery operations center, which has um, used um, sophisticated analytical tools that heretofore have been used principally in the intelligence and law enforcement sectors. And the novelty of what we have done is that those tools are now being used on government spending. And the result has been quite, quite uh, remarkable. Uh, it turns out that when you use those tools and when you put together uh, good, competent analysts, you can actually interrupt fraud and prevent fraud from happening in the first instance. Um, the model, I mean, this model um, is unique, is it not? Um, I mean, you were, in a sense, an experimental model, a new paradigm for transparency and oversight. Uh, I think that's true. I think we were an experiment. And I think uh, if you talk about proof of concept, I think we've done it. And that's why I think this legislation makes an awful lot of sense. I also think the Vice President's, uh, um, the President's executive order yesterday makes sense as well. Um, do you, uh, does your group the, uh, also, I mean, you are tracking to make sure money is not misspent and there isn't fr uh, fraud or waste, but do you also look at the other side of the equation, effectiveness, efficacy? Um, you, well, we are certainly, we're certainly trying to make sure that waste doesn't occur as well as fraud. I mean, we don't, we don't uh, concentrate solely on fraud. A lot of the um, information that we develop in the Recovery Operations Center, for instance, makes, uh, makes for good audits. But do you also look at milestones in terms of achievement? So in other words, if X number of dollars are meant to buy three locomotives uh, in some kind of time frame, that as a matter of fact, that goal is met? No, but uh, my sense is that uh, the individual IGs in those agencies do that job. And, uh, but we don't, as a board, take that on. You talked a little bit in your testimony, I think, about cloud computing and how it could actually lead to some savings for the Federal Government, including, uh, I think, uh, rental space and other kinds of savings and more efficiencies. Could you just expand a little bit on that and how cloud computing could help the government be more effective and to enhance transparency? Well, I think you, 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 there is an obvious uh, money savings to be had. I think when we first looked at it, we thought we could save, our little operation could save about uh, three-fourths of a million dollars right away, and we could repurpose some of that equipment that we had uh, into other areas. So there is a, there's a savings. The other thing I would say about cloud computing 
is it allows you to be more flexible and to expand almost like an accordion. If you need, if you need to do more, you can do more readily. You don't have to go out and buy more equipment, rent space, hire more people. So it is a, it's a, um, a technology that I think as uh, time has come, and I think the government ought to move there. We were the first government enterprise to actually move to the cloud. Um, the, um, um, the, that was heralded by uh, the uh, folks at OMB, and I think other agencies have followed. Uh, and real quickly, in the 10 seconds I got, um, do you believe the private sector can do this more efficiently, maybe, than we can in the public sector? Well, I don't know. I, I think they've, they, they certainly have been a leader there, but I think the government is, is slowly recognizing that we ought to be there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You are most welcome. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am only going to take a minute, Mr. Devaney. I wanted to thank you. I have only been here five months. I am over here, by the way. I am the guy with the sunburn. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is really refreshing. And I looked at your, your background. I, I love the fact that you are in a leadership coaching program. For somebody who has only been here five months, it is really a pleasure to sit and listen to somebody who has used great common sense and understands what a stewardship surely, a truly is. And, and in our business, there is no saying you have got to inspect what you expect. And what you have been able to shed light on today, and that both your written testimony and, and your verbal, I just want to thank you. I am telling you, this is great value to the American taxpayers, which is why we are all here. So I want to thank you for that, and, and I just want to tell you, it is really, this is the most refreshing, one of the most refreshing testimonies I have had since I have been here. I thank you for your service. And I heard what you said earlier, I, the uh, other gentleman had mentioned that this, hopefully this is your last, your last tour. I understand that. Uh, there, there is something to be, to be said for that. But thank you so much for your leadership. And having said that, I am going to yield back my time to the Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Chairman, uh, I think to make the record straight, I want to go through a, a line of thought. You said that what the Vice President is proposing, and, and you and I have both had meetings with the Vice President, you approve of, the President's executive order you approve of, and, and I appreciate that you, you like all or most of what is in our, draft legis or our legislation now. How do you envision that we get from the President's executive order, which, if I understand it correctly, is a study to do X over the next six months. Our legislation, which is intended to be pushed toward a particular set of goals with some specificity, Vice President Biden's history and oversight of, of your role, how do we bring that all together so that we get a permanent, executive orders are not permanent, and well-defined and bipartisan solution? in that, let us say, six months' time that the President has put out there? Uh, I, think the, um, I think both efforts move the ball down the field, and that is what I am really excited about. I think the goal is common between the two. I think we are talking about um, eliminating redundancy, saving money, and doing it in the most transparent and accountable way we possibly can. So, you know, as I looked at both things, I, I came away thinking they're both good. Um, I think the, um, as I mentioned earlier today, I think that nothing works better than legislation with uh, very firm dates in it. I, I, I really truly believe that. That's an observation, not just from my time at the recovery board, but throughout my federal career, uh, I've seen bureaucrats uh, change their mind about change and, uh, and agree to do it once there is a law and they have firm dates. So I am I'm very excited about your legislation. I think the Vice President um, is trying to get the ball moving, and I think in large part the President's executive order establishing this, this board is so we can do some things now, so we can take some lessons learned, so we can adopt some of the ideas I have and others have about trying to export what we have done throughout government, because it really would make things more efficient and it really would save money, and I think the country needs that right now. Well, thank you. Uh, I was at Sears this past weekend, and like you, I am old enough, uh, not that you are old, but I am old enough to, uh, to remember how Sears used to work, how Mays, Macy's, all of them used to work. You used to have a tag. Uh, either pinned or hanging from every piece of clothing and everything else you bought, and it had a noun nomenclature. It said something, 
and uh, sometimes it had a number. And every department had tags. And when you bought something, you had to put it, take it to a department where the person was knowledgeable of how to add that item up and price it. And you couldn't check out in one place because ultimately each department had the expertise. They knew what was on special and so on. Last weekend I went through and like we all have come uh, to expect, there is a standard barcode on every product. You can go to any checkout. You scan that barcode. They know what the price is. They know what the discount is. They know uh, all the aspects. It relieves it from inventory. And, uh, and you leave the store with one credit card receipt. Isn't that really what you are asking for all of us who are ultimately customers and vendors of the government, is that we get to that level of uniformity so that, in fact, everything gets to be easier to do with the government, whether you are, if you will, a vendor or a customer? Yes. I will take that as a yes. <laughs> and with that, I go to the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The, um, you know, Mr. Devaney, uh, I have told my staff at some point we move from student to teacher. And in listening to your testimony, um, I find it interesting that you, you didn't go where I thought you were going to go, but I saw you going there. Um, when you talked about the Secret Service and prevention, uh, making sure that the President and the others are safe. It's one thing to read a headline the day after talking about what happened if harm came. It's another thing, and you don't get a headline for this, to make sure they're safe. And I was thinking, I was wondering, how did you get there? In other words, I also tell my staff that there comes a point in time when you begin to face your own mortality. Not you, just talking in general. And you begin to ask yourself, how do I make sure that I'm most effective and efficient in what I do? And I guess what I'm trying to figure out is how do we, it sounds like you have arrived at a point of effectiveness and efficiency. And I think you said it seems as if, I don't know what you're referring to, uh, accountability and agencies. You said something about it's like a big plane or something like that. And it seems like so often we don't think we can get our arms around this because there are so many moving parts. And so I'm trying to figure out, with the executive order, with, with the chairman's legislation, um, how do we get folks actually moving in that direction of effectiveness and efficiency and, 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 and getting away from it can't be done this attitude or cultural mediocrity? I know that's kind of a broad question, but can you help us with that? Well, it's it, and how did uh, you get there? It, well, I, I don't know if I'm there. I, Are you there? I've made observations over the years that uh, that change in government is is a difficult proposition. Um, people don't normally embrace change in government. Um, I've never been afraid of change. I don't believe in change just for change's sake. But when it makes sense, when you can save money or eliminate uh, redundancy, it strikes me that you have to change, and particularly in the circumstances we currently live in. So I think that uh, both the executive order and the legislation uh, are going to cause people to understand that change is at hand, and we ha and we are moving in this direction smartly. So I'm um, I'm encouraged by that. I had uh, wondered whether or not the lessons learned in the recovery board would have been uh, thought well enough to have um, been embedded in legislation and also in the executive order, and I think. I'm, I'm pleased that they, they seemingly have been, and I'm excited about the opportunity to, to see some of those things um, spread out in the, all of government spending. This issue of, con in your lessons learned, you talked about concrete deadlines. And, and I want you to tell us how significant that is, because I, I agree with you on that. And uh, the other thing that you talked about was technology. And do you think that we, uh, do you think there's a, technology that can even go further and be even more effective than 
what we now have, uh, and what suggestions would you have to us for improving? I mean, if you had to make some suggestions for improving the bill uh, or improving the executive order. I don't think I'm ready to start making suggestions about improving either one of them just yet. I, I probably uh, will have some thoughts later on. I think the technology opportunities are profound right now, and uh, taking advantage of things like cloud computing or the geospatial uh, technologies that we are using in recovery.gov uh, opens opportunities for the American public to actually uh, for instance, in the recovery program to drill down into their own zip codes or their own congressional districts and see exactly how that money is being used. I don't think that's ever been possible before for the American public. As an IG, uh, if I wanted to understand where the money went, at, for instance, at the Department of Interior, I could have gone to the CFO and asked, but I doubt very seriously whether that person could have responded, uh, certainly quickly. So. Um, this, the new technologies have enabled um, the government to, to begin to show the public of how their money is being spent. Now, they may not like what they see, but they have a right to see it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Devaney, welcome. Glad you are here, and thank you for your testimony and your wisdom that you bring and your experience and background in this. Talk, talk me through a couple of things here. The, um, the differences or the problems that you would see associated with trying to transition this from a one-time specific set of events that is stimulus, as rapid as that was to ramp up, to learn quickly how to do it, figure out how to do it, then do it, but it is still a one-time event and an ongoing every year you know, uh, type program. What, what do you see as the differences? between those two in the reporting process? Well, I think maybe I will answer it this way. I think the, and, and it is a partial answer to uh, the Ranking Member's question as well, the, um, the fact that we had a deadline, uh, the, the, the Recovery Act called for uh, this, these websites and the reporting to all be done in six months, the fact that we had that deadline drove us to accomplish it. Uh, getting the agencies, OMB, and the Recovery Board to be marching towards that goal probably would have not been accomplished had that deadline not been in the Act. So I see legislation with concrete deadlines, as they are embedded in the Chairman's legislation, as being a very good thing because it, it, it leaves uh, the discussion about whether we want to change out of the picture change is going to happen, and you only have a certain amount of time to do it. Right. Do, do you see an issue, though, with a one-time event like a stimulus uh, versus an ongoing year-after-year year year type program? Anything that you would be able to say to us? I think this works well, and it, regardless of it is year-after-year programs or a one-time grant, uh, it works the same. Well, I think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the uh, recovery program was a, was a proof of concept. I think for those that had doubted that it could be done, we have now shown that it has been done and it probably bodes well for future efforts. Okay. Uh, burden on recipients. Obviously, this is a new layer of something that they have to be able to take on. My, my, um, well, while I, I desperately want more transparency, I agree completely with your statements about fraud, that the more you allow people to be able to look in and be able to look over someone else's shoulder and say, why, why exactly is that grant funded that way and what is that, that, that helps tremendously. I also don't want to reduce the number of people competing for a competitive grant, nor have, reduce the number of uh, bidders in a contract situation. Tell me about the burden on uh, those recipients having to self-report. Uh, do you think that is going to drive away competition? Is it a reasonable amount of burden? I think it is a reasonable amount of burden. I, I, it was a giant question when we first started. When we first were talking about recipient reporting versus agent reporting, I think the burden on recipients was the number one issue. It was an issue for the States. It was an issue for the recipients. It was, certainly was an issue for OMB and for the Board. And uh, we were very worried about that. And uh, as a result, we stood up a very robust help desk so that when recipients came in to report for the very first time and several reporting periods after that, they had a lot of help. Um, but after two or three reporting periods, uh, we began to see that our help desk wasn't being used anymore. And uh, anecdotally, we hear from States and from recipients that they like reporting on federalreporting.gov. 
I think what they would like best would only be to report to one place instead right. of multiple places. So I think if we get down to one place where they can report and uh, we use some of the technologies we used in, when we built federalreporting.gov or use that infrastructure, uh, we won't have a, a much of a burden on recipients. Okay, terrific. What other data would you suggest could be reported on that? For instance, if you complete a grant, uh, the final uh, research, uh, the, the finished product, is that something that could be reported there as well? So not only tracking how much was spent, but what the final product is that the Federal taxpayers paid for, uh, or the progress, as is mentioned before, is there a way to be able to track not only how much has been allotted to this, but what's happened so far so people can see this much has been allotted, this is what's been accomplished so far? Absolutely. We, we do that. We do something like that right now. We, we ask uh, recipients to tell us what stage the project is in. Okay. We could certainly collect almost any data you wanted to collect. Um, you do get to a point where how much is too much, right. but on the other hand, if that is uh, an important feature, we can build it in. We have the flexibility on the infrastructure we have right now to scale up to almost any amount of data to be collected. So if we are doing a, a, a grant for a certain project that denotes some research to something out there, at the end of it we could also say this was allotted, here is how it was spent, and here is the final paper that was presented at the end of it, and when the research was done, here it is. Right. wouldn't be an issue to be able to collect all together. We could. Terrific. Thank you very much. With that, I yield back. Would the gentleman yield? Absolutely would. As you compare the grant application process with your reporting, which one is harder to do, the applications for competitive grants that you have seen over the years or your reporting? Um, application for grants. Thank you. I kind of knew the answer to that one. We now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Devaney, not just for your presence here today and the great work you are doing for the Recovery Board, but for the great work you have done a number of years as an Inspector General. I had the good fortune to work as a United States Attorney and spent much time with some of your colleagues and appreciate the significance of, of their efforts, but oftentimes as well struggle with the reality that we would be off to touching the corners sometimes of what we believed was out there. And I have been intrigued by your testimony about some of the tools you have been discussing that can greatly enhance our ability to, to search not just where we have been, but in real time, because I, your words, I think, to focus on preventing fraud from occurring in the first time rather than detecting it after the fact. So can you tell me a little bit about the Recovery Explorer tool that you have been implementing and how that works? Well, the Recovery Operations Center, which we established uh, fairly early on after about six months, utilizes uh, analytical tools that, um, as I mentioned earlier, have been used heretofore in the intelligence world and the uh, some law enforcement settings, and applying them to spending. And if you, think of, if you think of fraud on a continuum where on one end of the uh, timeline the fraudster is thinking about stealing money and the other end is sort, sort of when he has it and he's running down the street, what we are trying to do is we are trying to push the ball further up towards the front end so that we are either preventing fraud in the first instance or at least interrupting it in the middle, so that countless times we have been able to detect um, a company or an individual that has gotten money that probably shouldn't have been. It doesn't mean that they have committed a crime. It just means that we need to stop and look. So we have asked the agencies to stop the flow of money so that it all doesn't go out the door before we are able to prevent it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it is difficult to articulate success in this area, how much you have prevented from happening. It is a lot easier for me to stand here and talk about the number of arrests or number of referrals to the Department of Justice. And that is what I have done for most of my career and play that sort of stat game. It is harder to articulate success in the prevention business. I'm, I struggle with it myself, but I know that I know that I think we have prevented fraud in this instance, and I think transparency has a lot to, lot to do about it. But it is also about sort of a, a mind shift that IGs and other enforcement entities are having about not just detecting it, but preventing it from happening. What kind of data does it display when you are talking about the, the broad spectrum of information that is out there? Is there an intelligent aspect to this in which it is looking for particular indicators or it makes available data that then somebody can can mine with a specific purpose? 
Well, we do have we do have uh, formulas and algorithms that we use to uh, to uh, run against the database, the fifteen twelve database, the recovery database, if you will, uh, that that uh, identifies anomalies for us. Uh, once again, this doesn't mean necessarily that a crime has been committed or even the fraud has happened. It might mean, for instance, this would be a good candidate to audit, to have an IG do an audit on it, not an investigation, but an audit. On the other hand, um, it, it might identify, as we do countless times, um, money going to somebody that is on the excluded parties list, because we have that database in-house. Uh, I happen to think that uh, one of the issues that is underway in, in government right now being managed by OMB is the do not pay list. I happen to think that, that our platform could do the do not pay list uh, fairly soon. I think we have three of the databases of the five right now. If we got the other two, we could probably stand that up maybe in a month or two. So there is great opportunities here to have it centralized in one place so that both agency personnel can come into the Recovery Operations Center before they give the money out, and that enforcers like IGs or the FBI or, any, or GAO can access information and maybe on top of some of the other databases, we have the law enforcement databases that they would have access to. And so you are talking right now about work that is done within your data system and, and monitoring the dollars that have been part of the Recovery Act. But my assumption here is this has tremendous applicability across the various agencies. We would be able to look at somebody that is on a do not pay list that might be doing work with two different kinds of agencies. I, I think it does have that application, and, and that is what I am excited about, that we take, we take what we have done here and apply it to all government spending. Uh, we will be preventing billions of dollars of fraud. And uh, we may be putting investigative bodies and U.S. attorneys out of business. Well, there is plenty of work for all of us to do. When you talk billions of dollars, that makes a big difference. Uh, Mr. Thank you for your service and your, your forward thinking. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you for being here. Uh, let me raise the issue of tax expenditures as a applies to these issues, if that is all right with you. Uh, your thoughts on whether tax expenditures should be incorporated into this sort of executive order or into the, the new bill that the Chairman is proposing, or perhaps a separate bill, such as a Transparency in Government Act? Your sense of the best way to move forward in that? Well, I am um, uh, I'm reminded of a recent event where we had a, um, an IG, I believe, where GAO came out with a report that basically said that uh, uh, taxpayers who, uh, who owed a lot of money were actually getting some of these awards. And uh, the first question asked of us was, well, why didn't you detect that? And that's because, um, you know, there are prohibitions from the IRS of sharing with us uh, taxpayer information. So I think perhaps the time has come for some waivers from that, from that Act, and I would love to see that. The ability for us to have um, a database that had the uh, individuals that owed tax money, we could keep that in a very secure environment, and, uh, and we would have prevented money from going to tax, tax recipients that owed tax money. And the best way to do that in terms of your sense of this bill or an executive order? Well, I think it could be, it probably would be better done in legislation because I think it is a law that causes the IRS to, uh, to uh, be prevented from sharing it with law enforcement. There is a, there is a proviso that, it's, that that kind of information can be shared with GAO, and uh, I, quite frankly, I think you know, even GAO would, would say that the IGs are just as, uh, just as responsible enough to have that kind of information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would the gentleman yield? Yes. I just, perhaps you can clear something up I'm unclear on. There's tax expenditures and then there's tax cheats or detected tax cheats. If I understood correctly, the database that you, potentially legislation would give you would be access to tax cheats, people who not not tax expenditures, per se. It is a more narrow definition. Right. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Oh, and you, the gentleman reclaims his time. Yeah, yes, and if I could yield to the ranking member. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Devaney, as part of the continuing resolution for FY 2011, uh, budget negotiator slash the electronic government fund from 
a proposed $35 million down to $8 million. Putting websites such as data.gov, usaspending.gov, performance.gov, and the IT dashboard at risk of being shut down. Are you aware of those cuts? I am. Uh, just yesterday, a coalition of transparency and open government groups wrote to the leadership of the House Appropriations Committee's Financial Services Subcommittee, urging them to restore funding for the electronic government fund. Uh, their uh, letter said this. And I quote, cuts to the e-government fund in FY 2011 have already hurt successful projects. Needed upgrades to increase transparency and improve data quality have been delayed or abandoned. And two projects have already been terminated. These cuts are penny wise and, and pound foolish. The e-gov fund supports powerful tools for reducing waste, fraud, and abuse, and for creating private sector jobs and giving appropriate funding these projects result in benefits far in excess of their cost. Mr. Devaney, you have uh, some practical experience with the technological tools for rooting out waste, fraud, and abuse. You just talked about it. You talked about the cloud system. Recovery.gov is one of our best examples of transparency-enabled accountability. Do you agree on the importance of these websites for generating accountability? I do. I, I've become a uh, a very uh, aggressive advocate of transparency. If you believe, as I do, that transparency drives accountability, ultimately you save money, and that money is far in excess of whatever, whatever we are talking about here. And how big of a role do you believe resources to be? In other words, how important was it that the RAT Board had the kind of resources it did to start from scratch, build out a good system, and then continue to enhance and improve it? Well, I think it was. It was. Um, I think the. I think it was a guess as to how much money we would have needed, and I think it was a very on-the-spot guess. And I think we were going to come in under our budget for two and a half years. Um, but having said that, I think that um, I think the penny-wise, dollar-foolish uh, uh, might be apropos in this particular instance. And looking back at the recovery gov. That gov what are the resource limitations, if any, in extending this kind of system government-wide, and how tall an order is that? Well, with respect to money, I don't think it's, it's actually much money. It's far below what people might imagine it to be. I think with a little extra money, the Board would be able to use its existing infrastructure and sit some of these other systems on top of that and create a one platform, as the Chairman mentioned earlier, that would, would do essentially the, the, the same thing that countless websites, to, uh, collection display websites across the government do now. Thank you. I don't recognize myself. I guess I'm, I'm what's left. Chairman Devaney, I, I'm assuming that you're, you'll never forget this chart, nor no, will I. It's uh, memorable. Well, uh, as I look at this chart, and, and not to be counter to the, uh, to the ranking member, because I, I share with him the frustration that in this basket of cuts, we seem to be cutting before we, in fact, fill, if you will. But your proposal and what uh, is intended out of our legislation and, quite frankly, what is intended out of the uh, President's executive order will ultimately save money on two fronts, won't it? One is, if you move to cloud computing, if you tell essentially all the agencies that we are going to have this single checkout place that is really good at checking out, that sets it up, that relieves that burden, other than transition cost, no matter what that cost is, and you are right, we shouldn't sit here and try to say it is $51 million or it is $5.1 million, isn't it inevitable that that cost post-transition is less than we spend on this labyrinth of information today? Absolutely. Well, let, me, let me go through a couple of quick questions just in closing, because I, I think we should make the record clear on where we are today as government. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, we may have one more questioner. Uh, some years ago, and you have been in government for 40-plus years, well, this was about 30 of those years ago. If you remember the scandal when they found out that the Federal Government, the largest purchaser of IBM Selectric's typewriters in the world, paid more than the State of California paid for IBM Selectric's contract, uh, uh, Selectric's II or Selectric's I's. And there was no fraud. They simply bid two separate times, and California apparently was just a little better in the bid, and IBM came in less. And the government didn't know about it until a whistleblower found out that in a combined uh, agency that the state paid less for the same typewriter. And 
That person tried to buy through the state to save money. It is now 30 years later. If we are paying for a Dell computer, if we are paying 20 different amounts, in, hypothetically based on bids, and Dell computer would be a bad example, but if we do have these discrepancies between hundreds of different purchase prices on the substantially or identically the same thing, do you have the resources in government or do you know of those resources that would call that out so that we could get the best and lowest price? Um, well, offhand, I would say that the, you know, the, the buying power is um, enhanced when you, when you do things, um, when you centralize your, your buying. And, and so if we, if we take that map that you have up there and we reduce it to a reasonable picture uh, with one platform, it would strike me that we could do it a lot cheaper because we would eliminate all of the myriad of buying opportunities that are going on right now across the government and centralize it in one place and achieve the leverage that we would need over the vendors. So even though that is not the first generation of what you are doing, mm -hmm. the idea that when people roll up what they are paying, that you can look and say, where are the anomalies and how much we are paying, where are the best values, that is pretty easy to do over the entire government, but only if you collect it in one place. Right. Well, let me ask one last question, uh, uh, and it's, I want a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I am not setting you up for the yes, sir. Okay. Historically, these reportings have been done by essentially cabinet positions and sub-cabinet positions. Both the President and we are talking about a single point. Are we talking in the best case about a single point that is independent, or is there any other conceivable way that would be as good as an agency that did one and only one thing, which was to run this collection, enforcement, and analysis? I, I think if you are if you're referring to the membership of the board or how, what that would look like, I think that one of the observations I made as I look back on the two and a half years is the all IG board uh, clearly indicates the independence that we all strive for and, and probably raises the public's perception tremendously that they are getting a, you know, a, an honest shot here. I think, however, that to make things work, to actually get the job done, you have to have a synergy between a board and the federal agencies and uh, OMB. And a board that has that kind of mix on it, I think, would be um, a good idea. I think that if a majority or at least half of the members are IGs, it, it presents that sort of optics of independence that I think is important as well. So I think the board that is contemplated in the uh, law that you have um, proffered. And also, uh, my understanding is the Vice President's, uh, the President's executive order and the Vice President's intention is to try to achieve that balance on that board as well. So what you are saying is, no matter how we achieve the board, as long as it is independent and perceived legitimately to be independent, it can work if it becomes captured by any one agency or entity. Uh, it loses its effectiveness. I would be very careful about uh, it being captured by any particular interest group. Thank you. The gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Mr. Chairman, I yelled back the time. Okay. Uh, he meant to me. I am going to use this because I have asked my questions and I appreciate the gentleman yielding. This is not the last time you are coming before this <laughs> committee. You may be out of office, but uh, we will use our subpoena power to bring you back to get educated. You know, there are just some things we can't live without, and one of them is uh, your advice and counsel. I know we would never have to use that. You have been very generous with your time, uh, both at these hearings and any time we have called on you for advice. So I want to thank you publicly for that. I want to pledge on behalf of the ranking member and myself both. This, you are one of the few people that we agree on. We don't have arguments about the job you are doing. We want to see you succeed and we want to see you have a legacy. So on behalf of, of the committee, thank you for your service. 
and we look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. And with that, we, uh, we stand uh, adjourned. And, oh, no, I'm sorry, I stand in recess. I was really getting choked up. We stand in recess as we set up for the second panel. <laughs>